Thanks to Nebula for sponsoring this video. Space is a modern fascination. These days, you're barely even a billionaire if you don't send phallic objects hurtling into the final frontier. But space is not a modern invention. Ancient people knew that up there is fundamentally different to down here. Anyone who lived near a mountain could have told you that things got colder as you got higher. Up there, the air is thin and it's cold. It stood to reason that the higher you went, the thinner and colder the air got. Eventually, there must be an outer space that was very different to here on the surface. The most influential ancient thinker on this subject was professional wrong opinion haver Aristotle, who divided the universe into concentric spheres of the classical elements – Earth, water, air, and fire. So stuff that happened over our heads could be divided into the study of stuff that happened in the sphere of air, meteorology, and stuff that happened in the sphere of fire, astronomy. This is where we get the name for the modern field of meteorology from. So Aristotle depicted there being a definite boundary between the atmosphere and outer space, and so a definite height above the Earth at which this boundary occurs. Today we know that there isn't really such a thing as a definite edge to space. The atmosphere just peters out, and there are several heights you could claim as the top of the atmosphere, the most common being the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers up, partly because it's a nice round number. I made a whole video about this previously. But while we think of science and specifically atmospheric science as coming from this long, unbroken line of the ancient Greeks to Renaissance Europe to the modern Western world, the reality is much more complex and much more interesting. Important contributions were made elsewhere. For example, the first estimate of that Aristotle-inspired height of the atmosphere, where outer space begins, was made by a man called Ibn Mu'adh al-Jayani. We don't know very much about Ibn Mu'adh. We know that he was a scholar and judge living in Andalusia, modern-day Spain. We know that he was alive for a solar eclipse in 1087, and wow, we really don't know much. But we do have a bunch of writings by him on mathematics, and specifically spherical geometry, that went on to be quite influential on mathematicians in both the Western and Arab worlds. One of his works detailed an experiment you can do to estimate the height of the atmosphere. It just involved some simple geometry and two simple measurements that I can take right now. This is the Western Round Hill on the outskirts of Bath, and I'm here because it makes the video more interesting. But it also has some of the best views in the entire city, which is really saying something. More specifically than that, it's going to give me a great view of the sunset. So the sun has just set, and I make that 4.31 p.m. Now all I've got to do is, uh, wait. To explain why I needed to wait, I made this model of the Earth. So we've got the planet and the atmosphere, and I've exaggerated the height of the atmosphere for the sake of this diagram. And let's say we're up here at the top. So we can draw a line to represent our horizon line. Anything above this line we can see, anything below we can't. For example, if the sun is above this line, then we can see it and it can also illuminate the atmosphere above us. This is daytime. But if the Earth spins on its axis and the sun dips below the horizon, here it can no longer be seen by us at the surface the sun sets. But while we can't see the sun at the surface, the atmosphere above us is still being illuminated by its rays. This is why the sky doesn't immediately darken when the sun sets. Instead, we go from daytime to twilight. Twilight lasts until the Earth has spun on its axis a little further, and the top of the atmosphere visible to us, up here, is no longer being illuminated by the sun's rays. Remember, I have exaggerated the size of the atmosphere for this diagram. When the sun reaches this point, which is the sunset from the perspective of the top of the atmosphere visible to us, then the sky above us is entirely dark. Exit light, enter night. Now, let me add two more lines from the center of the Earth to us as the observer on top of the Earth, and from the center of the Earth to this point. Ibn Muad realized that the angle between these two lines can be found by timing how long it took for the sun to move from this position to this position. 
In other words, from sunset to the end of twilight. We can do that because we know the sun travels through 360 degrees in 24 hours. So in, say, one hour, it travels through 360 divided by 24, 15 degrees. If we know this angle, and we know the radius of the Earth, which scholars have had estimates of for thousands of years, then we can do some trigonometry to calculate this extra height here. All I had to do was wait until twilight had finished. And he leaned down to press his cold lips once more to my throat. Okay, this is very imprecise, but I can certainly say that the sky behind me is completely dark. The sky above me is definitely dark. Over where the sun set, I've watched the light dim and dim. There's maybe a thin amount of light by the horizon, but I'm getting cold, uh, and I'm happy to say that that is the end of twilight. So by my watch, that's 5.49 p.m. approximately. I mean, it's dark enough to see the stars, so I think we can, we can claim that that's the end of twilight. Look, you can even actually see the names of my executive producer patrons over on patreon.com forward slash simonoxfizz. <sighs> Nature's amazing, isn't it? Okay, so we have our two times. Sunset happened at 4.31 and twilight ended at 5.49. That means that twilight lasted 78 minutes. And I can tell you that in that time, the sun traveled through 19.5 degrees. Now comes the cool bit. Let me add another line. I'm gonna split this angle in half. A line from here to the top of the atmosphere. That gives us a right angle triangle. This angle up here is a right angle. It's perpendicular to the radius. On one side of the right angle triangle, we have the radius of the Earth, let's call it R. And on the other side of the right angle triangle, we have the radius of the Earth plus the height of the atmosphere. So let's call that R plus H. The angle between those two lines is then 19.5 divided by two. So this angle here is 9.75 degrees. Because this is a right angled triangle, we can then define the cosine of this angle, let's just call it x, say, as the length of the adjacent side, r, over the length of the hypotenuse, which is r plus h. So we know what the radius of the Earth is, it's about 6,400 kilometers, and we know what this angle x is, 9.75 degrees. So let's rearrange this equation to find h, the height of the atmosphere. So using r equals 6,371 kilometers, and x equals 9.75 degrees, we find a value of the height of the atmosphere of 93 kilometers. Which, if you recall, the Kármán line, which is the common boundary for space that we use today, is 100 kilometers. I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> How does that compare to Ibn Muad, though? He calculated that the sun traveled through 18 degrees during twilight, and so using his value of the radius of the Earth, that meant that the height of the atmosphere was 84 kilometers, or 52 miles. So, I'm pretty close. Of course, however, this is a flawed method of calculating the height of the atmosphere. For one thing, it doesn't account for the effect of atmospheric refraction, something that was only added centuries later by Tycho Brahe. I'm also not sure how Ibn Muad handled the effect of the latitude of the observer on the calculation, because I don't have access to the original, and even if I did, I wouldn't be able to read it because it's in Arabic. But there's also the fact that there is no edge of space. Trying to assign one number for the height of the atmosphere where space begins inherently involves an arbitrary choice. But somewhere between about 80 kilometers and about 200 kilometers above the surface, the atmosphere stops behaving like the atmosphere that we know. And so, as well as being ingenious, I think Imam Wad's estimate is fine. It neatly demonstrates that not all atmospheric science is modern. It's actually one of the oldest of the sciences. And it's certainly not all Western. Both things I'd like to point out you can read more about in my book on the history of atmospheric science, Firmament. But more than that, I think it's a wonderful demonstration that with just two observations and a little bit of clever thinking, and you can discover something new about the world around you that you couldn't possibly have known before. And that, to me, that is the magic of science. 
I don't know if you can see it behind me, but that there is the constellation Orion, the hunter. And did you know that below the three stars of the bell, there's the three stars of his scabbard? Except the middle star in the scabbard isn't a star at all. Sorry, it was too cold out there. It's a nebula, a nebula that you can see with the naked eye. The Orion Nebula. Nebulae are the stellar nurseries of the universe. They're these places where brilliant new stars are made. And that's also true of this episode's sponsor, also called Nebula. Now, I'm going to put my cards on the table. I am part of the group of creators that created and manage Nebula. We built it as a place to post our videos away from advertisers. There are no adverts in videos on Nebula and away from the YouTube algorithm, a place we could experiment, cover topics that might risk demonetization and post content we were passionate about but would never perform on YouTube. For example, along with a whole raft of other original videos, I've posted an analysis of the carbon footprint of a well-known adult streaming site on Nebula. That would never have flown on YouTube. I also wouldn't have been able to produce a whole series on how I write and produce videos like this one without funding from Nebula. Turning data into stories is available on Nebula classes right now. By getting yourself a subscription to Nebula, you do three things. Firstly, you give yourself access to a huge library of content that's either exclusive to Nebula or is available there before anywhere else. Secondly, you support the evolution of independent online educational video. And thirdly, you directly support creators like me. If you like my videos and you'd like me to make more of them, then signing up to Nebula is one of the very best ways that you can make that happen. You can sign up at go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark. And if you do so using my link, you get 40% off. Meaning all those benefits I mentioned come at a cost of a little over $2.50 a month. That's it. The link again is go.nebula.tv slash Simon Clark, which will be in the description with thanks to Nebula for sponsoring this video. Thank you for watching the video. I really enjoyed putting this one together, perhaps unsurprisingly, given that I wrote a book on this stuff. If you'd like to see me make more videos about this history side of things, then do let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please do the YouTube pleasantries, pop it a like, share the video with people that you think may enjoy it. And if you'd like a recommendation of what to view next, then here's two videos I prepared earlier. That just leaves me to say thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.